Story continued from Fly Like a Leo playlist. A few days have passed since the female Fly Like a Leo's encounter with the various Dromornithids and the unlucky male. Since then, she has moved on to a more forested area and is resting in a tree. No other males have found her as of yet, and the amount of time that she will remain receptive is short. Not only that, but marsupials usually live short lives compared to placental mammals of similar size, so one missed breeding season can be serious for the species as a whole. Right now, she is more concerned with feeding herself, and in her treetop lookout, she can see potential prey. Her target is a group of Procoptodon, or short-faced kangaroos. There are many species, but this one, Procoptodon galia, is the largest, with males standing nearly 3 meters tall and weighing up to 240 kilograms. A modern red kangaroo may stand 2 meters tall, but only weigh about 50 kilograms. Both modern and ancient families of kangaroos live in Australia at this time, but their differences are not limited to their faces. Procoptodon Goliath, for instance, can't hop. Their bodies are too heavy for it. Such a movement would cause exhaustion or even tearing of tendons. Instead, Procoptodon put one large foot in front of the other, with their tails and head held out horizontally, making their movements look more like a theropod dinosaur than any modern kangaroo. When they need to run, however, they can rise onto the one toe on the end of their long feet and run almost like a human in order to escape threats. But this is also very energy taxing, so they can't do it for long. You may think that this low endurance would be a big benefit to the hungry Thylacaleo watching them from the tree, but she usually prefers to go after smaller species. Not because she can't bring down the huge marsupials, she can hunt herbivores much larger than them, but because of how the Procoptodon feed. Most kangaroos and wallabies are grazers, and so keep their heads low to the ground when feeding, but Procoptodon are browsers, preferring to feed from shrubs and trees, using their long arms to pull down branches and nip off leaves with their robust jaws. It is because of this that the Thylacaleo has more of a chance of being spotted, since the short-faced kangaroos spend most of their time looking up to where she usually hides. Like a modern leopard, her specialty is launching herself from the trees and taking prey by surprise. If they spot her before they are close enough, she has little chance of jumping down and chasing her quarry. She is built to wrestle and pin large animals, and not for running, so stealth is her best option. Fortunately, she is a master of this. The Procoptodon may be large and powerful, but they almost always run from danger and so are wary herbivores. When they aren't pulling leaves off of branches, they constantly look around while chewing. The female fire like Leo remains completely still, hoping that one will eventually get close enough in order for her to pounce down and deliver death from above. One female was almost in range. The marsupial lion would probably have to run along her branch in order to build up speed and launch herself out to reach her though. For the first time, she moved, rising up onto her legs, and just like that, an alarm went off. One of the other browsing Procoptodon had spotted her, and let out a series of cough-like bleats, and all mouths stopped chewing, and all ears were raised. The same Procoptodon turned and ran from the tree the Thylacaleo was in, and the rest followed suit. It was now or never. The carnivore ran along the tree branch and jumped horizontally, Forearms outstretched to wrangle the nearest Procoptodon, but her target had already moved, and so she landed with all four legs into a deep crouch. The Procoptodon were moving, but much slower than their smaller cousins, so their attacker gave chase. The grass was short, so the Thylacaleo could easily track her quarry, and the Procoptodon had forward-facing eyes, so they had to look back in order to see where she was. When they did so, each redirected their run to keep away from her claws and powerful teeth. She hadn't been running for long, but was already beginning to tire, and just couldn't close the gap between herself and her prey. She also didn't notice the Procoptodon to her right were changing course. Not until from that same direction, another Thylacoleo came out of nowhere and joined in on the hunt. 
In a highly rare instance, two marsupial lions work together to make a kill. The newcomer was a male, likely only here as he was following the female scent, but wasn't about to pass up an opportunity for a meal. He swiped at one of the Procoptodon cutting along its leg. The victim stumbled briefly, quickly regained its footing, but it was enough for the female to catch up and tackle her prey to the ground. She didn't go for the body. She wrapped her arms around one of its legs and using her weight pulled it down. As they struggled, she used her unique bolt cutter-like molars to bite down on the Procoptodon's ankles. She cut through the thick tendons and bit halfway through the bone beneath crippling the victim that could no longer run away. As it flailed to try and escape, the male Thylacoleo attacked its head, using his own jaws to bite down on the back of the prey's neck, severing the spine. This is something the female would have had to do on her own, but with the male's help, they took down the target in seconds instead of having a prolonged struggle with a heavy and dangerous prey item. No sooner had the Procoptodon stopped moving, the female Thylaca Leo hissed at the male, warning him to back off. Normally, she wouldn't abide another of her kind in her territory, but as he may be a good choice for a mate, she was tolerating him, but not enough to share her meal. When the male had backed up a sufficient amount, she grabbed the carcass in her jaws and pulled it into better cover. She would feed before further assessing the male, who in all likelihood would have to go hungry while staying by her side. Normally, these carnivores would haul their catches into a tree to keep it out of reach of scavengers, but Procoptodon are too heavy, so the female began to eat on the ground, while the male watched over her, happy to wait and fend off any other males that wanted her for themselves. Hello fellow travellers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down the largest species of kangaroo ever to have lived. Procoptodon. Procoptodon was a genus of kangaroos that lived during the Pleistocene in Australia, first named in 1876 by Richard Owen. Since then, up to eight species have been named, though some are more dubious than others. They range in size from Procoptodon gilly, which stood 1 meter tall, to Procoptodon golia, which stood 2.8 meters tall and weigh between 200 and 240 kilograms. They were of course marsupials, belonging to the Macropodidae family, which includes modern kangaroos, wallabies, quokkas, tree kangaroos, patamelons, and many others. There was another genus of short-faced kangaroos called the Cymostephenerus, which had multiple species of their own, all of which are also extinct. Though I will be covering the genus broadly, most information on this video will be about Procoptodon golia, as it is the most well known. So why the short face? This, as you might imagine, mostly has to do with their diet. Most modern kangaroos would be classed as grazers, feeding on grasses and low-lying plants. Procoptodon, though fully capable of feeding on these plants, was more of a browser, feeding on shrubs and the leaves of trees. As we can see, the skull is far more robust than a modern red kangaroo's skull, having much more developed chewing muscles to constantly chow down on tough plant material. In fact, Procoptodon goliath is thought to have the best adaptation for feeding on tough plants of all the short-faced kangaroos. The microware on their teeth also supports the browsing hypothesis. This helps explain how they were able to live alongside other families of kangaroos, as each had a specific niche or favoured food source, so they didn't compete with each other. One thing it didn't have in common with its modern counterparts, however, is that Procoptodon golia was unable to hop. Now, some of the smaller species may still have been able to hop, but golia was simply too large to do so. Not to go too deep into the mechanics of hopping, but basically kangaroos with their lightweight, massive legs and thick tendons are perfectly built for hopping, which is very good for energy retention, allowing them to bound for long periods. But large species like Procoptodon were so heavy that if they tried to hop, it would actually do the opposite and be more energy draining. More importantly, they would actually risk damaging the muscles and tendons on their legs. 
So how did they move? Well, when moving slowly, they likely use their hands and legs together similar to how modern kangaroos do. But they also may have been able to place one foot in front of the other, with their tails held out behind themselves and their heads held out in front. Kind of like a theropod dinosaur, but one that was wearing oversized flippers. Another theory, which sounds kind of scary to me, is that they walked and ran in an upright posture similar to a human, standing on their singular toe in a digitigrade stance. This would also mean that they would have developed a prominent buttocks. Overall, the debate on exactly how they walked is ongoing, but it's mostly agreed upon that Goliath, at least, didn't hop. The last species of Procoptodon, including Goliath, survived up to 45,000 years ago, with some evidence suggesting that they made it up to 18,000 years ago. During that time, Australia was gradually getting hotter and drier, which may have affected Procoptodon more than other megafauna. You see, because of their diet and from evidence on their teeth, Procoptodon is believed to have needed far more water than other large kangaroo species. Its reliance on large bodies of freestanding water could have played a major part in reducing the animal's numbers, as inland lakes dried up and forced Procoptodon into areas that either didn't have enough water, or enough of the plants they required. Now of course, the arrival of humans on Australia, about 60,000 years ago, no doubt had an impact on the continent's ecosystem, either directly or indirectly. Humans themselves are very water-dependent mammals, and because of this, they may have had more interactions with Procoptodon during that time. Some have suggested that when humans used fire on the landscape, that they may have affected the fauna that Procoptodon ate. But some of the known food that Procoptodon fed upon, such as chenopods and atriplex, are not greatly affected by fire, disproving that theory. In addition, no evidence of hunting or butchery has ever been found on any Procoptodon remains. But humans definitely saw and interacted with these creatures, as we have paintings of them across Australia, along with many other extinct megafauna species. The fact that the indigenous people of Australia lived with these huge animals, and that we have direct evidence of that, I think is something very special. But what do you think of Procoptodon? And for my question of the week, does the idea of one of these things walking around like a person feel kind of unsettling? I mean, just imagine you're camping in the bush and you turn around and suddenly there's a three meter tall jacked Procoptodon staring down at you. Nah, mate. Modern reds are scary enough. What lesser known extinct mammal would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and please don't go messing with kangaroos. They will mess you up, mate. <laughs>